Good afternoon and welcome to our pre-concert talk, the first of 2021. My name is Gary Levinson. I am the Artistic Director of the Chamber Music Society of Fort Worth, and it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome my very good friend, Lori Shulman, our musical guide to this pre-concert talk. Welcome, Lori. Thank you, Gary. I am so happy to be here, and I can't tell you how good it feels to be saying this is the year 2021. Indeed, it's going to be a fantastic year, and we have a wonderful program that I've called the Bohemian Luxury, mostly because the kind of sonorities you get in these two pieces are both unusual and extremely luxurious. And I think given what we went through in 2020, this is the kind of luxury we all deserve and are yearning for. One of the things that I love about your Bohemian Luxury program is that it's all for strings and none of them is in a conventional combination. We first have the wonderful string trio of Dochnani, and then we have a string quintet, which doesn't double the viola or double the cello, but adds a string bass. And that is so unusual. Both of these pieces are very dear to my heart, and they are unusual, as you had mentioned, especially the work of Ernst Dochnani, where most of us know the name Dochnani as a former music director of the Cleveland Orchestra. But this man, his grandfather, Ernst von Dochnani, was a very important Czech composer and a wonderful pianist. Lori, what can you tell us about his early history? He started out taking violin and piano lessons, but he turned out to be a real prodigy on the piano. Most of his study took place in Vienna, but when he left Vienna, he studied with Eugène Dalbert, the great Belgian-French pianist, and then launched a concert career that sent him all over the Western world between about 1898 and 1908. After that, he moved to a different stage of his career. He was teaching at the Berlin Hochschule for a number of years, and then he left there to go to Budapest. He had Hungarian roots. He was directing the Royal Academy of Music there and then became the conductor of the Budapest Philharmonic. I think he is largely thought of in today's world as an academic for his era, but the thing is that he wrote the string trio in 1902 when he was at the height of his performing career. And it seems like a surprising thing for a pianist to have done, except he also studied violin when he was younger and he understood string playing. I find it just a fascinating work. What is your perspective on it as a violinist? Well, it is a very unusual way of composing for the instrument. Yes, it lies pretty well in the hands, However, there are passages that are very awkward. And the great composers always did that. And I'd like to believe that the awkwardness is necessary to the language that you refer to. His language is so unusual and so incredibly scintillating for me that the technical challenges are necessary to make the music really sing and stand out on its own. I think we should also address the fact that he called this a serenade for string trio and not a string trio. The nomenclature is significant because, first of all, it's in five movements rather than the conventional four or three would have been perfectly suitable for a string trio. But more to the point is that there's no sonata form movement. Everything is based on a traditional dance form or an outgrowth of a simpler form than a sonata. And I think that he was embracing the heritage of the 18th and 19th centuries by adopting that title and by expanding to the five movements. The march is a very interesting way to open. It's almost like a Baroque thing that you could get people into a processional like they would in the church. And um, it's just such a great opener. Shall we listen to the first one? <laughs> This march seems like it's rhythmically straightforward, but it really isn't. If you think about it, he's counting in six beats rather than a repetition of four, and he's introducing syncopations that make it a lot more subtle rhythmically than you would expect from a conventional march. His second theme is more folk-like. It introduces a modal quality to it that I think harks back to the folk music of Central Europe. I'm struck by the fact that he uses a pedal point in here, almost as if we were listening to a bagpipe or some other kind of instrument that could give us a drone. Let's listen. <laughs> In 
in the first two movements of this serenade, I find his language very reflective. It shows that he was schooled in the world of Brahms and Wagner and certainly the great classicists. He starts to break away from that as the serenade proceeds. If we listen to the Romanza, it's definitely a nod to tradition because he starts very quietly and he gives us a gentle pizzicato accompaniment. Later on in the Romanza, he's sort of exploring the underbelly of romantic passion and agitation. That's the part that I find most interesting in this movement. Let's hear the next example. of all those solos it is in some ways an homage to Dvorak but I also think it's much more raw and it's much more muscular where the instruments don't just sing they're more in your face and I really love playing them because oftentimes you can play much more on the G string the cello is really meaty the viola line none, none of this is like melody and accompaniment it's, it's almost like a, a, a three-dimensional texture almost polyphonic your mention of polyphony takes us directly to the scherzo, which starts out as a vigorous and very complicated fugato. And after giving each of the three instruments its turn at that fugal subject, he puts them in a rapid unison that has got to be really difficult to play rhythmically, precisely, and in tune. Can we listen to that, please? So this movement, which is really a modo perpetuo, is very interesting in that for the violin, you have broken intervals that go in rapid succession, and it's something that I find actually very difficult to speak, even on our instruments. You know, I use titanium strings, I use all the 21st century technology, and it's still very difficult to make it all speak, and I wonder if it was even more difficult in Dohnani's time. The bows, certainly in Bohemia, were nowhere on the level, though they did have some great makers not on the level of the great French bows. And it's just something that is really interesting writing and is very difficult to execute for all three instruments. I believe that challenging for the listener as well because of the rhythmic complexity that I mentioned, but also because he's using a more dramatic kind of harmonic language that seems to be breaking from the tradition of late Romanticism and Brahms. This piece is from the very early years of the 20th century, and it's still rooted in tonality, but I hear the folk elements of the modal scales from the rural areas of Czechoslovakia and Hungary making themselves known in this music. The largest scale movement in this serenade is the theme and variations that constitutes the fourth movement. The theme itself is very chorale-like. We hear the instruments in near rhythmic unison, but the harmony is changing. Each time he repeats the melodic phrase, he's giving it a different harmony. Can we listen to that, please? Did you hear how he shifted that on the second statement of that theme? He's giving us a hint at the various ways in which he's going to change it over the course of the variations that ensue. You know, those of us who are pianists probably remember the first piece that they played, like 
What about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and the variations afterwards, right? But this is a much more subtle set of variations, whereas you said the harmonies change. He changes texture. It's not the kind of thing that you go, well, oh, I hear the tune here because maybe two or three more notes in the variations. It's much yes. more subtle variations. And I think very effective because it is folksy. It's the kind of thing that I imagine he probably heard in some pub when a violinist or a guitarist would play a tune and improvise for 20 minutes and you were hanging on every note because you didn't know what was coming next. Indeed. The variation that I've chosen, since we don't have time to sample all of them, draws on that folk tradition. Again, we hear the harmonic variety that you talked about, but you're also going to hear a decoration in the violin and the viola is going to give us yet another pedal point. He likes that drone idea, but there's this wild dialogue going on between the violin and the cello that harks back to what you were describing about the dense writing in the Romanza. Let's listen. <laughs> in the finale to this serenade, it turns out that it's sort of a rondo, but he gives us a main theme that is decidedly dance-like. We know we are going back to the serenade tradition when he embraces folk dance in this way. Let's hear that first theme. <laughs> He plays around with a lot and returns to it, usually with slight variations. But the most dramatic thing that happens in this rondo is that at the end of it, he brings back the marcha that started the whole serenade. The profile of this finale is very virtuosic. And it's very interesting because this one, unlike the scherzo, for example, lies beautifully on the instrument. And even though it has challenges, it's really fun to play. It's something that you feel, okay, now I am in my breadbasket and I can really relax and just let it fly. It's a very exciting movement both to listen to and to perform. I would imagine that as Senior Principal Associate Concertmaster, you've done your share of chamber music as well and generally in larger ensembles. Could you address the intimacy that results from one each on violin, viola, and cello? It's a very different dynamic from a string quartet, isn't it? It is. I'm glad you mentioned the string quartet. In many ways, this is a more broad way of approaching string writing. I'm always kind of amazed at some of the big string trios. And by the way, we performed the Opus 9, number 1 and 2 on this series of Beethoven. And it's amazing how early Beethoven was still able to have the breadth of three instruments that make you not only believe that you're listening to four, but sometimes even five instruments. There's a certain power to the string trio which I understand maybe originated in the trio sonata and in the Baroque, but this kind of string writing is absolutely muscular and it does have some intimate moments. But when you need to open it up and really have serious drama, nobody is thinking, man, I wish I had some more instruments. It's, it's a powerful, powerful combination and uh, really in some ways, maybe a little bit even more flexible than the string quartet, which is the king of all all chamber music. Something that I enjoyed in revisiting this serenade is the way the viola and the cello trade places as to which instrument is providing the bass underpinning. Indeed. Because there are several places where the viola has that role in its low register and the cello is a more active participant in the melody, as we said earlier, often in dialogue with the violin. But just mentioning the bass actually takes us to the anchor work on the program, this splendid Dvorak string quintet, which is an amazing piece of music, not only because it's vintage Dvorak, but also because it doesn't use the conventional string quintet instrumentation with a second viola or a second cello. He chooses double bass. 
how does that change the overall sonority and the feeling of ensemble? I think that the double bass gives a, a really special anchor to it. I'm, of course, biased because my dad's a double bass player. But I will say that it is a, a wonderful foundation for the quintet, and it's also something that gives the soprano voice, the violin, the ability to sort of soar without having to hold things together that the bass, were it not scored for the bass, w would be done by the cello. Um, and it, it's just a wonderful sonority. I love the string quintets with the bass. You know, in some ways, the most famous bass chamber work is the trial quintet, where the okay. piano is doing you know, the majority of, of the bass work and everything else. But in this piece, the bass has some wonderful solos and it really teams up with the cello in a way that is just unique and it's a great sound. I'm so glad that Dvorak picked it for us. I love the first movement because it is so rich in themes. I'm reminded of something that Brahms wrote back to his friends in Vienna during the summer that he wrote the second symphony. He was in this beautiful mountain town in the Austrian Alps called Perchach am Wörthersee, and he wrote that there are so many melodies flying about that you have to be careful not to step on them. <laughs> That's the way Dvorak must have felt when he was writing this first movement. He has two first themes before he even gets around to shifting gears for a second theme. They just pile one after another, and each one is so endearing and fresh, you just want to hold it close to you. Let's listen to his first theme. So I'm hearing triplets and I'm hearing something that's very dance-like. It certainly seems informal, like a Prague street band might be, or a group of folk dancers. But he's not done with his ideas. We're still in G major, the home tonality, when he gives us the second theme, which normally would modulate. But here it is. It's a related idea. It's a subsidiary idea, but it's distinctly its own theme and he gives it variety by placing it in the cello. So he's drawing attention to the lower register. Let's listen. Then when he finally does give us a third theme, a new theme, he moves it to F major, which is about the last place you would expect to be for a piece in G major, you would expect that you were going to be going to D major and certainly not a flat key, but he's still in the triplets and he's using chords for the middle voices. So he's tying everything together and it turns out he's faking us out a little bit because soon enough he's going to go where the conventional rules would say the tonality that he's supposed to be in. But he's, it's like he's playing a practical joke on us, which is sort of a very Beethovenian thing to do. Let's listen to that third theme. Did you notice how he was using chords for the middle voices, the second violin, the viola, and the cello? So tell us about Dvorak's house in New York, Gary. You lived there for many years, not in Dvorak's house, but in New York. Right. It, New York is always going to be home for me, and this plaque is very dear to my heart for the simple reason that Dvorak's New World Symphony was premiered when he was living in this house at the opening of Carnegie Hall, premiered by the New York Philharmonic. And this house, when I was, I would say in the early 90s, I think, it was actually torn down and just about the entire music community of the world was against it. But this was at the height of the AIDS epidemic and the hospital nearby needed the room. And so they tore down this house, even though it was so important, I think for the posterity of Dvorak and, and all of our musical souls, but obviously saving lives took precedence. We know where it is still because the plaque is still there. Very nice. That's a great story. We should specify that although there are hints in this string quintet 
of the kind of music that Dvorak would be writing when he was in the United States. This particular work dates from the mid 1870s, long before he had the invitation from Jeanette Thurber to come to New York and head up her new music school there. Let's move on to the scherzo and trio of this quintet. I'm very struck by the fact that they are on such a large scale. With all the repeats observed, which is standard procedure in a scherzo and trio, this movement is a little over nine minutes long. That is extraordinary for a scherzo trio, which is often the throwaway movement in a large scale four movement work, but not so here. What do you make of that? Well, I think this is much more akin to this slide here, the Czech countryside. When you hear the street music of Prague, the street music really of all the Slavs, it is kind of timeless. And I believe that Dvorak wanted us to sort of revel in this scherzo, not the kind of scherzo that Beethoven or Brahms would have written that goes on to something, as you had mentioned. This is just enjoying the music, enjoying the countryside. It's a musical love portrait to his country. And I think in some ways it is irrelevant and possibly immaterial about the length of it or whether you take all of the repeats. By the way, this quintet actually has five movements. We're not doing the intermezzo movement because it makes the piece really, really long. But if we were to play every single note that he actually wrote, the piece is almost an hour. So I, I really believe the breadth of this music and the way he sort of conceived it is important to not think about the time just to kind of sit back and, and really revel in the music. The opening is very dance-like. It um, resembles the Czech Furiant, which has nothing to do with being furious. It does have a rhythmic vibrancy to it. And another characteristic uh, that crops up frequently in Dvorak's music is a dichotomy between major mode and minor mode. The movement is technically in minor mode, but he gives us plenty of hints of major mode right from the start in this opening scared so let's listen <laughs> The trio switches, you are expecting a contrast, but he switches to duple time, which is somewhat unusual. He moves it to C major, and mostly the focus is on the first violin until the longer second half of this trio section. But the example that I've chosen, we hear the beginning of it, where you'll get a clear sense of the duple meter. And of course, we hear how bottomless his fount of imagination was for these melodies that just keep pouring forth. Dvorak's lyricism is really world famous and deservedly so. I always felt like in some ways his melodies are too good and he doesn't get enough respect for his structure and the way he actually layers things. It's just so pretty to listen to, right? And then you sort of forget that, yeah, this guy's actually a first class composer. As Brahms thought when he discovered him, in his famous competition and how he brought him to Simrock. It's, it's really, it's it, in a way, too much talent in too small a space where it's just one after the other. Well, we hear that songful quality in the beginning of his gorgeous Andante and the pizzicato bass, even though it's in a supporting role harmonically here, it adds a gravitas at the same time that it lightens it up, reminding us that dance is never very far from the minds of the Czech people. Let's hear the beginning of the Andante. Now, of course, in a slow movement, you do want to have some sort of contrast in the middle. He switches to E major for his middle section. It's the same tempo, 
but it becomes extremely chromatic and has surprising emotional intensity and drama. Once again, the bass has a more prominent role and the harmonic filler, the busy work, if you will, is happening in the middle voices of the second violin, the viola, and the cello. Let's listen to this emotional turbulence in the middle of the slow movement. <laughs> Dvorak's finale indisputably returns to the world of the Czech countryside and Czech dancing. I hear a pre-echo of his American quartet in this opening. What do you think, Gary? Oh, I think it's perfect. You know, the American quartet, it's actually much more similar than people think to the Czech folk dancing. And the melodies are, I think, in some more ways more similar than they are different. And so you've got virtuosity, you've got fun, and it's just kind of endless going crazy without having anybody telling you to stop. It's, it's exactly, I think, what we're all yearning for as soon as we can get out of our houses and go to live concerts. Absolutely. Here again, as in the first movement, he is rich in melodies. He gives us a new theme in E flat major that turns out to be a sort of rondo subject. Eventually he's going to return to the home key of G major, but it's a delicious theme and I couldn't resist clipping it for us to hear. These two themes together provide the grist for his mill and they yield most of what happens throughout the balance of the finale. It becomes more dramatic as he develops intertwining these two principal ideas as we'll hear in this next example. the omitted intermezzo, which is not performed very often. It is an extraordinarily long work, but even with the modestly truncated version that you're doing, it's a solid half hour and will slip past in no time flat because the music is so delicious. It is a really wonderfully constructed work, but I just want to reemphasize that just because it's a beautiful melody doesn't mean that he doesn't know where he's going with it. If you just kind of let the melodies wash over you as a performer, then it actually does suffer and feels just like one good tune after another. So I think the construction of this work is really spectacular. It's fun to play. It's infinitely fun to listen to. And I really think that our audience will agree that it's a great way to usher in 2021. I agree, certainly. And I believe it's unprecedented for CMSFW to have an all string program and I'm so looking forward to this afternoon's concert. Considering our slightly revised format of being about one hour no intermission because of the pandemic, um, this I think hangs together as a good concert and um, we will have one more like this that won't be all a string concert but the idea is that when you listen to this as an audience member in your own private space you feel like you've just gone to a concert. It just happens to be in the same room. <laughs> So let's go to a concert. Thank you, Lori, so much for all of your insight, for your wonderful ability to make the music come to life through words. I look forward to working with you for our next free concert talk, and I invite all of our audience to visit cmfsw.org to learn more about the organization, learn more about our future concerts, and just enjoy this afternoon's concert. We'll see you soon.
Playing for the Fort Worth Chamber Music Society is always one of the highlights of my life and it's wonderful to make music with friends and to be together and have great camaraderie. But like everything else in our business, it is just so important to keep it going. And that is why, I'm sure you've heard this before, it's important to elicit your support to keep this going. And I just cannot say enough good things about this wonderful organization for you to support. Keep bringing us back again and again, please.
Thank you. 